Welcome everybody to the International Switch Energy Case Competition Finals. My name is Preston Bomschel and I'm joined by Philip Bolton. We're both interns at Switch Energy Alliance and I've spent the last five months collaborating with Tohai Syed, Syed Termizi, Bill Hayes and the entire Switch Energy Alliance team to organize this incredible opportunity for teams around the world to come together and tackle the issue of energy poverty. Blowing all of our expectations out of the water, the competition began with roughly 250 teams from 37 countries, with only 18 of those advancing to the semifinals. And out of those few teams, only seven have landed a spot in the finals today. It's truly a remarkable achievement to have made it this far, and our preliminary and semifinalist judges were incredibly impressed with your proposals. Now, these finalists will have the opportunity to dazzle the final judges live and compete for a total of $11,000. Each team will begin their presentation with a three minute summary of their proposal, after which the team will be asked approximately three questions by the judges and will receive a total of 10 minutes to respond. Following the end of each team's Q&A, the judges will take two to three minutes to score the team. After all seven teams present, we will total the judges scores and announce the results. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed panel of judges for the finals here today. Our first judge is Melody Meyer. Melody Meyer joined the boards of BP, ABV, and National Oil Well Varco as a non-executive director in 2017. She serves on the board of trustees of Trinity University and on the board of the National Bureau of Asian Research. Ms. Meyer is president of two companies, Melody Meyer Energy LLC and Women with Energy LLC to advocate for the advancement of women in energy. Melody retired from Chevron after 37 years of distinguished service with extensive leadership expertise in global upstream operations, strategic and business planning, major capital project execution, capital allocation, and in delivering superior financial results. From 2011 to 2016, she was president of Chevron Asia Pacific Exploration and Production. Previously, she was president of Chevron Energy Technology Company and vice president of Gulf of Mexico and US Mid-Continent Strategic Business Units. She held key international operations leadership assignments in Kazakhstan and Angola. Ms. Meyer graduated from Trinity University in 1979 with a BS degree in mechanical engineering science and attended Dartmouth Tuck Executive Education Program in 1997. Our second judge here today is Dr. Gurchen Gulan. Dr. Gulan is an energy economist with 25 years of international experience in oil, natural gas, and electric power value chains strategic technical assistance and customized capacity building in numerous countries, having worked with ministries, regulatory agencies, private and state companies, universities, and NGOs. After nine years at the University of Houston and 13 years at the Bureau of Economic Geology, he is now principal at G2 Energy Insights LLC and continues to instruct for the Texas Ex Executive Education. Dr. Gulan has published peer-reviewed and industry periodicals and presented to a wide range of audiences internationally. He is a USA EE senior fellow. He has received a PhD in economics from Boston College and a BA in economics from Bosphorus University in Istanbul, Turkey. Our third judge joining us is Rob Stoner. Rob Stoner is the deputy director for science technology of the MIT Energy Initiative and the founding director of the MIT Tata Center for Technology and Design. He also serves on the MIT Energy Council, the Science and Technology Committee of the U.S. National Renewable Energy Laboratory, the Rockefeller Foundation funded Global Commission to End Energy Poverty, and as the president of the International Conservation Fund. Stoner is a serial entrepreneur and the inventor and co-inventor of numerous computational and ultra-fast optical measurement techniques. From 2007 through 2009, he lived and worked in Africa and India while serving in a variety of senior roles within the Clinton Foundation including as the CEO of the Clinton Development Initiative. For the past decade, his research at MIT has been at the intersection of energy technology, society and computation, and with an emphasis on power systems design, optimization, and regulation in developing countries. Stoner earned his bachelor's degree in engineering physics from Queen's University in Canada, and his PhD in condensed matter physics from Brown University, where he is also an adjunct member of the engineering faculty from 1995 through 2002. And now here are our top seven finalists. 
team number 76, Hyperion from Venezuela, team 99 in the greens from the United States, team 146, Lalton from India, team 163, Texan Sparkling of the World from the United States, team 190, KEYJ from the United States, and uh, team 214, Energizer Bunny from the United States, and team 218, UNDB from Algeria. First to present today is Team 76, Hyperion. Please unmute and share your screen. Good luck. So, Hi, can, you can you can you hear us? Yes, Hello. we can. Okay. Oh. Um, Try and speak up. It's a tiny bit, tiny bit quiet. Okay, but um, if you can hear me right, I'm going to start with the resume. To hear us. Sí, sí. Okay. Okay. Hello, we are the Hyperion team, and this is our project, Illumineer for Haiti. Energy access is necessary to achieve human development. However, 8 million people in Haiti remain without electricity access due to political instability, outdated equipment, and lack of maintenance. This translates into just 8 to 14 daily hours of electrical service to a third of the population, where at least half of them are illegally connected to the grid. To relieve the complex situation, the World Bank Group started a project in 2017 to power five of the nine regional grids in the south of the country. So to give continuity to the previous actions and light up the center and north of the country, we present Illumina. Our project consists of a three-stage process. Regarding the design, Illumina has two main objectives. The first one is generating local electricity through renewable energies in rural communities, and the second is to centralize and give reliability to the electrical system in Haiti. To achieve our goals in the first stage, we need to promote the alliance between Switch Energy Alliance and the MTPTC Energy Cell to create a network of local volunteer communities for the execution of the project, and thus integrate students and professionals of different universities around the country. This alliance will be approaching all the communities to which they want to bring access to electricity and learn about their energy needs although those communities that don't wish to receive help must be respected. To bring energy solutions for the rural Haiti population, in five years, Illuminar project implements the use of distributed generation by applying local solar plants and off-grid wind turbines. Using this method, a major shutdown won't affect those communities since they rely on local grids regarding an initial investment of up to $60 million. Therefore, distributed generation can improve local economies without pollution and set the basis to connect the local grids for a centralized system in the near future. This system can be integrated into conservative communities in a non-invasive way and always providing electricity when and where it's needed. In the final stage, hundreds of thousands of Haitians will have access to electricity thanks to the previous actions. Nevertheless, to achieve higher standards of living, the integration of these microgrids into a bigger grid is essential. However, this stage requires big amounts of inversion and a grid update. One of the technologies that show bigger potential in specific zones is wind energy. These farms can provide the energy needed on the smaller grids, reducing the intermittency and increasing the flexibility and availability of the grid. We have in our hands the opportunity to change the course of a neighboring country. Haiti would be able to make a sustainable and steady transition to a system that allows the country to shift from being the poorest in the whole continent to a promising future. There has not been another most accurate moment like today to illuminate days, Sorry for nights, but the nights, the time has finished and for dreams. the summary and kindly please quickly complete your talk and then we will proceed to the question on the session. Yes, we are done. We're done, yes.
Melody, if you may uh, uh, start off the Q&A round with the first question. Sure, excellent job, you guys. Um, I, and I enjoyed your presentation in uh, full. A couple of questions I had. The importance of reliability and sustainability of the existing system is so critical to meet the overall demand and the growth that's expected. So I, I felt like you, I, I'd like to know more about how focused your effort will be on reliability and maintenance of the existing system as you supplement with wind and solar um, as well. But, and, and I guess another quick that is with the reliability of the existing system, can wind and solar meet the full demand for the country? Thank you. Well, thanks very much for the question. It's a great question since reliability is key on the system and most in developing countries. Um, what happens when, when we centralize, we have these intermittent renewable energies like solar and wind. The sun doesn't shine every day and the wind doesn't blow every day. So you have to complement the system and that's why we're doing an integration of systems. The, the previous grid um, had a lot of problems, as we know, transmission lines, lack of maintenance, um, and even there are corruption issues inside of the electricity, the IT. So um, transmission lines, for example, need to be updated, no matter what technology we use. So the investment must be done on a way that the complete grid is reliable and that the peak demands can be can be supplied. And you do this by the integration of several technologies. So we would have solar, we will have wind, we will have hydroelectricity that represents the 18% of the country's share, and we will have coal that Haiti uh, depends on coal. So um, with the integration of this of these renewable energies, the energy renewable energy share will, will increase, and then coal will diminish, and you can the money that you use for buying fossil fuels because Haiti imports their fossil fuels, you use it for renewable energies. And then you have a flexible system that you can supply all the demand needed. Thank you. Also, we want to add that at the first moment, we can practice preventive maintenance techniques. Uh, for the solar models, you today only require periodical cleaning if the installation is done correctly. So in this sense, Time based maintenance will be the ideal technique to apply for with cleaning inspections that could be planned and scheduled for the year by qualified teams. And on the other hand, if the equipment starts to report failures or bad functions due to specific events or mistakes during the installation, a corrective maintenance program should be applied in order to restore the model function. Thank you. Question. Rob, if you'd like to ask your question now, feel free. Sure. Uh, my question <clears throat> relates to the same sort of challenge of, of integrating these uh, technologies together. In your presentation, you referred to diesel generators that were already installed in the numerous microgrids spread around the country that you propose to supplement or uh, power rather with, with solar and wind. What will you do with those? diesel generators, will you use them in some way or will you remove them? Um, you have a, a, a ton of grids that rely on these fossil fuels and these diesel generators, but, but most of them are so unreliable because the load on them was never calculated. So you have a diesel system that it is meant for supplying two houses and it supplies 10 houses. So it, it's even, it's harm, it harms the health of the Hadians. So what we would do with the system, you, you can eliminate them. So we, we, we would use them as, as a backup in terms of a massive blackout. Um, you would use these diesel generators and uh, supply until the demand, until the, the, the main grid is restored, the, until the energy is restored. Okay, thank you. Dr. Gulan, I believe you're on mute. It's gonna happen at some point. <laughs> that helps to unmute. Thank you. Uh, good job. 
I'm going to ask specifically about your third phase, which was the connection via a transmission grid of disparate distributed systems. But the, the question applies to some of the other parts of your analysis, including the question Rob asked, if you're going to replace the diesel generators with solar or wind or any other combination of cleaner technologies. And the fundamental question regarding the transmission is, I did not see a cost comparison. How, did you calculate the cost of connecting via long distance transmission lines? Haiti is not that big to begin with, but when you put wind in some distant location from the load centers, there's gonna be wind, there's gonna be distributed solar. Did you make any calculations to compare the cost of building that transmission grid to connect these different intermittent and variable resources to actually expanding the capacity of those distributed generation resources? Well, thank you very much for the question. It's a great question because when you have to connect these microgrids into a bigger grid, you say, well, hey, this current grid is on a deplorable situation. So what, would, what do you do? Is it, is it cost effective? Well, what happens with wind and uh, with large wind farms and, and solar is that the costs are scaling down really fast. So um, when you calculate the cost of, of updating the transmission and installing this system, um, well, let's think about it. Uh, a household in Haiti uses $40, $70 monthly on buying wood, on buying diesel, on buying kerosene. So they are willing to pay these systems. If a billing system is applied, if the, if the connection is well done, they are willing to do this. And so it, the, the inversion that the companies are going to make, they're going to, they're going to return it because Haitians really want, they, they need this energy and they are, the cost, um, it, it, it's feasible, it's economically feasible um, since what you have to do is update it. Uh, you have a, a, a bad grid and you have to update it on a cost per miles of kilowatt hour per miles. And since the Haitians want to pay, the, it's going to be cost effective. Okay. Anyone else from the team wants to add anything? Jose, please mute your microphone. Yes. Uh, at the first moment, we want to uh, update the billing system that is one of the current issues about the uh, EDH and Haiti National Electric uh, Service. We, want, we plan to do this uh, by installing microcontrollers into each household uh, that are inexpensive uh, microcontrollers that measure the amount of energy consumed, the, uh, the amount of energy consumed for each household and providing the energy with uh, in renewable energies, we decrease the cost that uh, main patients, uh, people pay for the, for the, uh, for, yes, for their energy. So that's all. Okay, so you thought about it. I can see that from your answer but I didn't see any of these calculations in your presentation, even a hint of it that, you know, if you build this wind in the Northern part of Haiti, build a, I don't know, maybe hundred kilometer new transmission line, improve the rest of the transmission line, total cost of this versus the total cost of the existing system. And, you know, I'm not gonna even get into the willingness and ability to pay of Haitians. That's a separate discussion, but, you thought about this clearly, but I didn't see any proof of that in your presentation. That's why I was asking the question. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I can, if I can add something, but um, the thing is, since we were so short on time, and as you may know, the, the energy economics are a really wide subject and require a lot of time, um, we couldn't deep so... We, the amount of numbers that you had to put in the presentation couldn't be like so large. So we, we focused on the, on the price to pay per kilowatt hour. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna shut up for the last minute. Melody, Rob, do you have any follow-up questions? Uh, no, I think you're, the question you're asking is uh, very, very relevant. 
Uh, I think that the cost challenges will be a problem, but I, I, I would uh, <clears throat> congratulate the team for having thought about the, the future uh, opportunity to integrate these grids into a larger system. Yeah, I agree. And I, I, I just think that we can't underscore enough and your comments reflect that you've thought about this, that it's the hurricane hardening. Haiti, Haiti is in a zone of, you know, sustainability is very important and reliability of these systems as you integrate them. Um, would have been good to spend a bit more time in some of the um, uh, areas that way, because you have to look at the long-term sustainability. But great job on the um, options that you evaluated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. All right, thank you, Team 76 Hyperion. Uh, we're going to kick it off to Team 99 in the greens. If you all don't, if you want to share screen and unmute. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, I'll begin. Hi, we're Team in the greens. Today we want to address PNG's energy poverty crisis. PNG is only 13% electrified and past energy plans fail due to political and environmental challenges. PNG does not have a national grid as it's mostly covered in tropical forests. The country does have three regional grids that provide limited electricity at a very high cost. We utilized a strict methodology to approach this problem and reach our conclusions. A least cost approach based on cultural and geospatial studies indicated an off-grid approach was relevant for the majority of households. A levelized cost of energy analysis determined how to electrify these households. Our on-grid solution is split into intensification and extension. Intensification repairs the unreliable existing connections while extension connects households close to the existing grid. Hydropower would be used to power these homes. For off-grid solutions, we first looked at solar. As nearly everyone in PNG has heard of solar and more than half are currently using some form of solar product we found that three-fifths of the country has average daily sunlight exposure of more than six hours, which is ideal for solar. Our solar plan would have two parts, a community center for education and immunization purposes and a family home kit, which includes an electric stove and lighting and others. For highland regions without efficient sunlight, we recommended a biogas solution. This means using biofuel from animals to generate biogas through a natural process and then converting that to electricity. There are more than a million pigs in these highland regions, making biogas communities both economically and technically feasible. For financing considerations, we thought about PNG's past, which includes exploitive corporations and debt trap diplomacy. We avoided that by sourcing loans and grants from trustworthy partners. Public-private partnerships are used to cover early stage risk. Energy costs are subsidized to ensure successful implementation. Accounting for both investment costs and funding sources for the entire plan we found we can reach 70% electrification by 2030 while reducing costs by 69%. The plan would be sustainable. It would deepen energy markets so that private players and state-owned enterprises could assume control to achieve future plans such as Vision 2050. A majority off-grid solution is optimal for PNG as it protects the country's natural resources, aligns with the UN's sustainable development goals, promotes health, and is respectful to indigenous populations. In conclusion, our plan alone will not only electrify PNG, but also increase GDP per capita, reduce infant mortality, increase labor force participation, and more. Thank you. We're ready for questions uh, whenever you guys are. Okay, I, I think I'm supposed to ask the first one. This is Rob. Um, I, I was uh, impressed by the quantitative character of your plan and, and discussion, uh, so congratulations on that, as well as by your focus on rural areas, and there are a lot of people living in rural areas that are not supplied with modern forms of energy in the PNG, um, and you talk about bringing some of those in, in PPPs with, with concessionary debt and so on. Mm -hmm. I wonder though what you think about um, selecting vendors that can be relied on to maintain those systems over the long term and how you can try to ensure that that will happen within the plan so that these don't become abandoned investments uh, within a relatively short number of years. 
Yeah, so I can I can start off by answering that, and maybe if my group members want to add on, add on to that, it's, it's a great question, and it's something that we we did consider when when developing this plan. There are uh, I, I'd say a various amount of small scale vendors and and companies and startups and you know just plans in general that are implementing solar solutions at a very small level. So we looked at some of the failures of implementation, including lack of cultural uh, I guess cultural respect and accountability. Um, and, and that's how we developed our plan. We, we, there is, we know that there is a labor force in PNG that is underutilized and ready to work to implement this plan. And so part of our, one of the things that I couldn't talk about in the previous pre presentation, but uh, is our electrification task force, setting that up to avoid some of these past problems, as you mentioned, and making sure that these projects aren't, aren't abandoned. And you know, when we talked with our mentor who, who um, works for a private company that invests in some of these regions, he talked about how um, these are high risk areas because there's not you know, reliable access to financing. Um, so our plan really centered around um, focusing on developing these energy markets so that private players and even state owned enterprises could operate um, on a safer level and a more reliable level later. Zika Riley, do you have anything to add? Sure, sure, sure thing. Yeah, that's a great question. And I want to add that in, in terms of selecting vendors, we have we are doing this, you know, mostly three stage plan. In the first plan, we're setting up an independent task force, like Sophic mentioned, that's made of foreign government players, non government organizations, and independent advisors. And after that, in, that's in phase one. And in phase two, we hope to use the trainings that we receive from this task force and uh, resell solar panels as well as, well as biogas systems to the private sector and have them implement this. And in phase three, which is 2030 and beyond, we hope that the, develop, the private sector has been developed enough so that the private sector can, can supply all future energy needs. And uh, we think that a native uh, vendors by the native population in small businesses in the long term will be the best solution for PNG. Okay, thank you. Hi guys, congratulations. I totally agree with Rob. I mean, when I looked at your presentation and of course in the 10 minute video, you couldn't go through it, but your slides were very dense with information, uh, especially quantitative information as well as qualitative information. Now, I guess the question I'm gonna ask is the downside of putting all that information because now you expose yourself to economists like me asking questions about uh, details. On slide 13, my specific question, you have charts on LCOE estimates. Are those uh, estimates for PNG specifically that you calculated yourself? And uh, if so, what did you assume in terms of uh, solar irradiation and capacity factor? What did you assume for the natural gas price? I mean, PNG is a major producer and exporter of gas, right? Uh, so. And if they are not specific to PNG, do you think these some generic LCOE estimate, appropriate estimates to use for PNG? Yeah, so I can, I can start that off. That's a great question. Um, so one of the problems that we actually ran into when researching was maybe some of the, the lack of very in-depth research around LCOE. Um, we were lucky to find some research. Um, this is from Ernst & Young and Jackson Fort Partners, which I think operates out of uh, Australia. And they came up with this LCOE um, information for specifically PNG to answer that first part of your question. Uh, you can see at scale, hydropower um, is, is the least cost solution, but at smaller scales, solar power um, ends up being the least cost solution. Um, so uh, we, we also thought about LNG in depth because PNG's problem was never a lack of resources. They have enough hydropower by itself to, to um, power the entire country. They have enough LNG to power, I think, uh, the entire country over 95 times over. Um, but with the problem with LNG that we saw was distribution. So there's a lack of infrastructure connecting these rural communities. Um, there aren't roads and it would involve environmental de degrad degradation uh, to establish a majority on-grid solution. Um, so for that, for the off-grid part of our solution, P uh, LNG was, was never really uh, a possibility. 
Yeah. Right? So uh, to, 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 to add on to what is Havix is, uh, in terms of considering the different energy costs, I mean, our, our solution is split into on-grid and off-grid. For on-grid, we're, we're going to first use the massive amount of LNG resources that PNG has, as seen by prior ExxonMobil projects. And uh, lots of these projects can be re replicated in other oil fields, which have tons of LNG. So for on-grid solutions, that, that's where we'll start. And for off-grid solutions, be because of the fact that the national grid is so unreliable and so limited, we're proposing majority of our energy uh, solution to be off-grid. And, and the cal calculations for that, because it's off-grid, has to be done, uh, done independently by us, to which we, we looked at the import, uh, the solar panel importation cost, as well as things such as the biogas, uh, biogas consultant cost and how much it costs to import these biogas electricity conversion engines and things like that. So mm -hmm. the LOC is more done to look at, to do analysis on the on-grid solution, the least cost for that. And for off-grid, we did our own independent calculations in terms of cost. Yeah, and Zeke, if you can go, go to slide 14, something that I just want to add on to our on-grid solution. Um, you can see that our, our on-grid solution was really about expanding the unreliable grid. Um, there's already a lot of independently financed projects underway, uh, mostly related to hydropower. I listed four if you look at the top left uh, of, this, of this slide, but there, there's many more than that. But these are already projects under construction, um, and there's many more that have been already, uh, I guess, surveyed and, and feasib like feasibility surveys have been conducted, but you can see the massive amount of you know, hydroelectric power. Um, I think in total, there's, there's more than 15,000 megawatts um, in potential capacity. So that would more than supply our grid through 2030. And, in, in, and that's, that's where our 70% electrification goal is. And then after that, it's, it's uh, we, as we mentioned, we, we transfer over to private, private industry. And stay down okay, there. excellent. Melody? Sure, great job um, to this team. And I also wanna say I have a bit of a leg up on you because I, uh, I was intimately involved in the first oil development in Papua New Guinea in the 1987. So I spent a lot of time in the highlands around Lake Kudabu and Port Moresby and understand the country intimately. So I thought you did a, a very good job. I, I, I was gonna ask about the financing, but that was covered in the first question. So I, I really wanna talk about um, project execution um, uh, insurance, really on the hydro and the biogas. So I want to understand how you're going to ensure that these projects get executed in a um, you know, cost-effective way to be able to provide affordable power. And particularly on biogas, how are you going to um, um, implement that at scale that will make a meaningful in impact in the off-grid solution? Sure thing. Yeah, I, I, I can take that question for the biogas portion, maybe solve it for the hydro. So, uh, so, so for, the, for, the, for the biogas solution, first of all, all of our solutions will be done through this electrification task force that's set up by non-government organizations as well as foreign tr trustworthy governments uh, such as Australia and the U.S. And what they'll do is they'll administer a, a unbiased independent, independent task force to really look to look through and overlook the entire process. In terms of how we'll implement the biogas at scale, we, we, we have a list here. So basically, the first thing we we'll do is we'll import engines that converts biogas into electricity with the help of a few diesel or natural gas. From there, we'll, we'll seek consultants using the connections from our electrification task force. After that, we'll look to uh, locals in terms of how to build these biogas plants. Uh, afterwards, we'll go to village by village, market our biogas solution, talk about its p potential for use for lighting, cooking fuel, and eventually uh, electricity. What we plan is that at first, we'll only implement a normal biogas solution, which is used for lighting and, and cooking. And afterwards, Time when, when the, the villages are familiar with the solution, we all get, we'll get a, uh, well, we'll start the electrification phase. So that's how we plan to implement the biogas portion of our solution. Thank you. Yeah, I don't. I know that we've run out of time, but if I can quick, quickly just talk about hydropower and maybe one sentence. 
Um, a lot of these hydropower, independently financed hydropower projects are already underway and they're set to be complete in 2022 and 2023. So these aren't really up in the air hydropower projects, uh, at least um, some of the ones I've listed. And there's already, there's many more, as I mentioned, um, that are potentially going to be uh, started. So um, as far as that's concerned, it, it's the, fee, the execution is less, I guess, uncertain. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Um, we'll give the judges a couple minutes to finalize any scoring for this round or last round uh, while the next team um, gets their presentation set up on the screen. So that'll be team 146, Lalton. So I'll, I'll let you guys know when to start in a couple minutes. Thanks. Okay, hi, this is Sudhi from Team Lalton. Uh, should I share my screen? Yeah, you can go ahead and share your screen. Um, just okay. um, hold off a few minutes and then we'll, we'll let you know when to start presenting, when the three minutes starts. Okay. All right, well, we're free to go. Good luck. Thank you. Yeah, so am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Hello, everyone. We are Team Lalteen from India. We have chosen Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the richest country in the world. Yes, for it possesses abundance of natural resources. So the question is, what makes it one of the poorest? Well, we feel the answer is lack of energy access. And the three main challenges being administrative challenges, social challenges, and financial challenges. These challenges are, are so closely interrelated to each other that they create a complex chain reaction. Armed conflicts and corruption create market instability, ultimately depriving DRC from its access to energy. Let's talk about our proposed solution, which is fundamentally centered on decentralization of power generation, step-by-step -step implementation, and taking inspiration from Kenya and trying to replicate it in DRC's context. So in the first stage of our solution, we try to improve energy access in DRC, and we believe that off-grid solar power, micro hydropower plants, and rehabilitating existing hydropower plants are the key to do that. In the second stage, we focus on establishing energy security by investing in uh, ambitious projects such as geothermal, and of course, building the ambitious and game-changer Grand Inga Dam. Now, let's talk about the financial aspects of things. And we have tried to propose certain creative solutions, such as crowdfunding, which is basically de-risking the investments. Secondly, we believe that local businesses can form associations to generate and sell their own power and extract economic benefits out of them. Also, we believe that the empowerment of the mining sector is integral for the development of the energy sector as well. Now, under implementation, we have basically looked at how brilliantly Kenya has implemented its own solution by essentially creating three pillars, that is planning, institutional and financial pillars, with each of their roles clearly divided. We believe that DRC should definitely try to replicate it in its own context. We also believe that in order to reduce corruption, the government should collaborate with the private sector. So it will in incentivize the government to ensure that there is market stability in these regions and it keeps off armed conflicts as well. In addition, the government can promote local demands over, for for over foreign exports. To scale our problem, we have divided DRC into four parts. These divisions have been done considering several factors. And after we have come to this realization that the initial points of focus should be the uh, regions which are here in this oval, that is the Western and Southern DRC. So our overall timeline looks like this. In the first stage, we focus on improving energy access primarily in Western and Southern DRC. Then in, uh, after 2030, we shift our focus to Eastern DRC and start investing in more capital intensive ambitious projects like geothermal and nuclear. 
And of course, in the last stage, our focus should start shifting towards establishing energy security by bringing all these projects into fusion and fitting all these uh, puzzle pieces together. And we should, uh, and uh, efforts should be made to ensure that not even a single citizen of the Democratic Republic of Congo is left behind. Thank you. Uh, we are ready for questions now. Okay, good job, guys. I think I'm going to ask the first question this round. I thought that you guys did a great job identifying the governance and institutional challenges in DRC. And I mean, that is, that set of challenges exists pretty much everywhere around the world, but of course, DRC is an extreme case. And I also found the three pillars approach of Kenya intriguing, but I didn't quite understand uh, how do you envision implementing those three pillars in a place like DRC with all of its uh, governance and institutional challenges? I mean, Kenya is not a poster child of stable country, but, you know, if they implement it. So can you elaborate a little bit more? How do you see DRC adopting those three pillars? Of course, that's a very pertinent question and a very important one as well. Uh, so in our solution, we have basically focused on decentralization of power generation, right? So we want that uh, there is uh, there is least uh, interference or uh, there is least responsibility from uh, authorities and uh, the the power the the efforts or the power generation should go directly to the people. So uh, whatever private companies are involved, they can collaborate directly with the people, and we can set up off-grid solar power plants or micro hydro power plants. Uh, we have also uh, in our financial aspect. We have uh, given a solution that people can form local associations and businesses to generate their own power plants. We optimistically think that uh, in the future, because of because of these decentralized solutions, there would be enough economic growth generated, which would introduce stability in the DRC and hopefully better political stability. In the so after that, if uh, uh, hopefully when uh, this this polit uh, better political framework in place, uh, we have uh, this particular table, uh, and we and we want that uh, the distribution of responsibility should be dedicated, and it should be in uh, such manner that there should be a lead institution, uh, which is the Ministry of Energy, uh, and of course uh, there should be a national government, which is, which takes takes more uh, institutions such as the Energy Regulatory Commission, Commission, a Rural Electrification Authority, and then the private electricity. Suppliers should come into play. So we believe that you know decentralization would be a, a, a good a good point uh, to add. Yeah. If uh, Kalyan, Abhinav, or Ankita have anything to add, please. I mean, you can write a PhD dissertation. Every single one of you can write a PhD dissertation on this. But uh, I like your answer. But clearly, I'm not going to steal the time of Melody and Rob. So this table, though, just to quickly clarify, don't go into details. Because you talked about decentralization, but all I see on this table are lead national institutions. Where are the three decentralized institutions? Okay, yeah, that, that is correct. Uh, well, uh, we, decentralized solutions were basically focused on the private players. And we have uh, developed our timeline in such a way that in the initial years, like 2020 to 30, uh, these players will be into play. Like there will be independent bodies working. <laughs> and after some stability has been introduced, we can then look into uh, establishing these institutions and giving their particular roles. Yeah, so that's, okay. that's kind of uh, what we were thinking. Next question. I don't know who's next, but I'll go. Uh, I think it's you, Melody. Okay, Melody. great. So again, a, a great job to this team. And this is another country I have deep experience in. I was a project manager of two of the offshore, tiny offshore field developments back in the 80s. Uh, then Zaire, now DRC. But um, the question I had, uh, similar, it, you, 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 is about funding on these projects really. And you, you raise the issue of crowdfunding and the possibility that uh, communities can invest and deliver in these small projects. Help me understand um, with some of the challenges in the country, how, how do you plan to uh, generate this funding for um, uh, the projects? 
Right, right. So about the financials, it is one of the biggest problems because uh, there is so much armed conflicts in the DRC, which uh, essentially leads to market instability. So there's a very, there's a big lack of funding. So what we thought that uh, we cannot uh, depend on just one investor, like we can't go to uh, just one foreign investor, a big player and ask him or her to invest their resources because it is a huge risk project. So uh, we have tried to, uh, you know, uh, 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 ensure that uh, we we can go by decentralized investing, which is basically crowd in, uh, funding. It is a kind of a cocktail of philanthropy and profitability because we have seen that uh, there are several platforms like Trine.com, uh, which is a platform which uh, uh, which basically works in Europe and it 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 uh, generates uh, generates uh, investments from uh, from decentralized investors. So uh, uh, that is important because the, what this does basically is that it minimizes risk by dividing the losses. So not just not just one investor has to bear the entire brunt of uh, if there is, uh, you know, unfortunately, if there is some kind of a risk involved. Uh, and also we have uh, uh, actually observed in uh, countries like Kenya that people have uh, actually profited out of uh, out of investing in these. So I think that uh, since it is already established and it has been well thought out uh, by certain established platforms, we can get into that. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, one way. And another uh, very important thing is that the DRC has lots of mineral resources uh, such as cobalt, copper, and uh, we have uh, be we believe that you know empowering uh, the mining sector uh, would create a synergy between the energy and the mining sector because uh, this is a kind of a interrelated interrelated energy sector because mining sector is huge uh, hugely energy intensive. So if we try to reduce uh, you know exploitative practices and promote better work environments and uh, less exploitation in the mining sector, we can generate uh, generate enough economic revenue which can be you know then fueled into the energy sector. So that is how we plan to uh, you know uh, get into the financial part of things. Thank you for that. I, I, you know, I guess the, the challenge I have thinking of crowdfunding is what incentivizes people, but I do think you ought to think hard about what benefit the carbon land sinks have in countries like uh, DRC that would incentivize people to get involved in other projects if they could offset with the carbon land sinks. I also just want to compliment you on the analogy uh, and uh, looking at Kenya as a best practice and seeing how to adapt. So I'll turn over the last question to Rob. Thanks, Melody. I'm actually a little bit confused about your approach. In your, in your longer presentation, you focused most of your time on grid-based generation technology uh, and very little on, on off-grid uh, or what you call decentralized. So perhaps I'm not understanding your terminology. In particular, you focused on rehabilitating hydro generation from INGA in your plan, which was decidedly on-grid. And in, moreover, in concentrating your investments in the early years in the Southeast, which is closer to the dam and close to large load centers. But you never really explained why the dam, which would be one of the largest investments in the plan, uh, wasn't well maintained in the first place. It made me wonder if the distributor is really a reliable customer for the generator and whether it's capable of paying for power from the dam in order to make the dam uh, a viable business. Can you, can you explain? Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, mismanagement of equipment in already existing hydropower plants is a huge problem in the DRC, along with corruption in uh, maintaining those. So uh, we believe that uh, that is why we have been talking about decentralization, right? That uh, instead of focusing on uh, such large scale power plants, we should be focusing on micro hydropower plants so that uh, when people, when the, when the, uh, when local businesses, you know, run these things, uh, so they will have an incentive that if, if these, uh, if these uh, power plants are not maintained properly, then their mm -hmm. communities would suffer. So, uh, you know, there, there is, it is very tough to actually tell people to not be corrupt or teach them to not be corrupt. So what we can do is to, you know, get a turnaround or manager turnaround uh, in this and try to uh, introduce more uh, off-grid solution or decentralized solutions. Of course, uh, the DRC has some experience with, uh, you know, these large, uh, you know, on-grid hydropower plants. So uh, the, uh, the funding that exists right now should be in training, uh, you know, in training the, uh, the people that are working in these power, power plants uh, to, to uh, you know, uh, uh, resort to ethical standards and also, you know, maintain the equipments properly. So that is, that is a great challenge that the DRC has to, you know, address. If anyone has... Uh, yeah, I would like to quickly add one point. Um, since these both uh, Inga 1 and Inga 2 dams were, are pretty old, 
and uh, while construction of these dams a lot of funds have been uh, missing and uh, been because of the corruption back then and these are not being maintained currently so they are not at their full, full potential right now there is a project called inga 3 in talks and uh, these hydropower projects uh, rely on huge capital so it's around 40 billion dollars is the capital for inga 3 and it uh, it has a proposed plan to generate around 11 gigawatts of electricity so we are we are planning to come to that at a later point of point of time when these off grid solutions uh, come into fruition people will get more uh, you know courageous to take on high capital investments i see yeah yeah so i misconstrued your presentation then you're you're saying focus on off grid initially and only rehabilitate the grid and and on grid generation later Uh, actually yes uh, that was the message uh, we're sorry if it got misconveyed yeah. time has finished for the q and a session okay so all right uh, thank you team 146 if the judges could take a moment to uh record the scoring and then we'll uh move on to team 163 texan sparking the world from the us you could uh come off mute and share your screens um sure appreciate it and just we'll we'll key you when to uh, begin All right, scores are in. Um you can get started when you feel when you're ready. Got it. All right, well, good morning everyone and thank you for having us. We are Texan Spark in the World and we're here today to demonstrate to you how our energy evolution plan is going to take Papua New Guinea to the next level by enabling widespread reliable energy access. The uniqueness of our energy plan starts at the beginning. Our entire first phase of our three-phase plan is based around the concept that if you want to develop sustainable long-term growth in the country, You need to make sure you have a stable foundation to stand on before you incite major new infrastructure development. That's why in the first phase of our energy evolution plan, we'll be using tax incentives to influence existing energy companies to invest in the maintenance and repairs for existing energy infrastructure, which is currently very unreliable and unstable. Not only is starting with this consolidation phase going to help us in the long term by providing a proper foundation for growth, but it's also the most economically feasible and easy to implement way to have a significant and immediate impact. Moving into phase 2 of our energy plan, this is where we're really going to start getting into the development of new infrastructure. In urban settings, we're going to be moving forward with the goals of previous Papua New Guinea plans by developing new energy generation infrastructure, often renewable and economic corridors. On the more rural front, we plan on implementing our distributed energy incentive initiative, which will use the country's energy companies to develop small-scale energy generation projects in remote communities that will then use a microloan model to return the investment over time. Once we have the proper laid foundation from phase 1 and the new infrastructure from phase 2, it's time to move forward into phase 3, the expansion phase. This third phase is all about taking what we've developed upon in the cities and what we've initiated out in the rural communities and integrating them together in a way that creates a reliable and diversified energy network that will take the people of Papua New Guinea into a future of growth and prosperity. The way that our plan engages those rural hard to reach communities along with evolving the way in which cities operate with electricity There's going to be a newfound capability for Papua New Guinea to develop on societal fronts like never before and even on the world stage. For one, by giving so many communities access to power that they've never previously had, there's going to be a noticeable positive impact on the quality of their day-to-day -day lives. And with that, you're going to see people taking advantage of opportunities they previously have never had. I'm talking about revolutionizing healthcare access, decimating urban unemployment, uh, igniting a newfound entrepreneurial industry. The possibilities really are endless. This plan is going to have a positive impact on millions of people and it's going to spark an economic engine for the likes of which Papua New Guinea has never seen before, especially with the amount of foreign investors and companies this development is going to attract. And it's going to accomplish all this in a decentralized way to match the decentralized structure of the country. This is to make sure that we create energy evolution, not energy revolution, so we can keep intact the identity of this country and its beautiful cultures while positively impacting the lives of millions of people. Thank you.
how can we answer y'all's questions? Yeah, I think I have the first question. Uh, thank you very much, guys. And I had many, many questions, but Rob and Melody, I think they're gonna ask some of them. So my question is, uh, you had a concept in your final slide, I believe it's called decentralized economy equal decentralized solution. But also, again, you talked in your presentation today that you're gonna build on existing efforts of the government of, I guess, some of the central generation stations, gas and hydro. So, what do you exactly mean by decentralized economy and decentralized solution? And how do you see specifically what technologies uh, is the best solution for different parts of PNG? And did you do any economic analysis to justify that? So I can take that. Um, so what we mean is initially we wanna start with, you know, taking what's already existing and making it work. That's gonna be somewhat more centralized and as the plan is progressing is to work towards a more decentralized system. Um, and that's gonna be integrating or utilizing some of those uh, uh, distributed energy technologies with our distributed energy incentive initiative, um, specifically utilizing solar, um, biogas, and small scale hydro in some of these small communities. And so we're gonna sort of have during phase two, both the, um, the working in, in type three or type one communities, so the big cities, uh, and then type two and three communities, which are more rural, uh, and kind of having them going both at the same time, development of both the decentralized and some of that centralized at the same time, working eventually towards integrating the two and having decisions made um, based on the community and, and what their needs are. And we didn't do um, specific economic analysis of, of some of these things, because again, we think that some of these decisions are best made on a case by case basis to see what is most economically uh, beneficial for these communities. Um, but that was uh, a consideration when we looked into how the private industries would be involved in making some of these decisions and what the government's response and some of their role in is in uh, facilitating the, the uh, implementation or ease of access to some of these technologies. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. I mean, I could follow up, but I don't want to steal others' time. So yeah, thank you very much for that answer. You're welcome. I think Rob is next. I was muted. Let me try that again. I asked it brilliantly the first time. I'll see if I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your, your financial plan um, relies on, on, at least initially, the use of tax incentives to generators um, and carbon taxes for, for non-renewables uh, to produce a cash flow uh, th that will enable your system consolidation and expansion investments in later years. And I, I, I struggle to understand that. Um, we're in a situation where there's a generation deficit. Um, and, and I wondered if you, you have any sort of quantitative basis for how that approach works. So I can go ahead and take this one. So although we don't have a quantitative basis, what we really relied on is, is taking a look at the motivations behind these things and behind these developments. So people and these private companies in the countries are going to do what the most uh, e easily available route is in order for them to make profit. If, unless they're state run, then, then they also align with the state's motivations. So the thing we went off of for this logic is that uh, we're basically going to give these these companies that work on the maintenance and improvement of their current existing infrastructure by giving them these tax incentives and by motivating them with the fact that uh, in developing themselves and generating an economic engine, that's going to bring in all sorts of foreign investment, foreign opportunities. The electrification of the society is going to bring about this new entrepreneurial uh, industry and, and it's going to create this growth from within. So it's, it's selling the plan to them just as much as it is selling the plan to the government, but those tax cuts, those tax cut incentives will be that motivation that initiates that economic engine. And that's going to initiate those companies to take action in fixing what's currently there. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I think you're talking about subsidies in a way and, and yes. using the tax system as a way of introducing them. I wonder if there might be more targeted ways of, of subsidizing things 
but that's something for further further thought, I think. Next question, I think, Melody, you're up. I am, yeah, great job, team. Um, so th the question I had, and I think it would have been helpful in the presentation to um, to have a table of some sort to show what, what are the various energy options that you will be introducing and what percent contribution from each, because it's really hard to understand you know, how the balance, if you're, you know, advising the Ministry of Energy, how are you telling that person what the balance of is? But the question, yeah, I, I, I believe you had geothermal as one of the uh, potential solutions, along with hydroelectric and many other types of options. I want to understand um, how did you assess, and I have experience with ge geothermal, how did you assess that geothermal would actually be able to contribute such a sizable percentage in 2040 um, because, you know, it's, it's not been really able to be executed at scale in many countries other than the Philippines or Indonesia. But what, what basis did you use to say that geothermal is going to be a, a good option out in 2040 like you predict? So I can answer this. Um, the basis was fairly similar to um, our analysis that we took with hydroelectric. Um, although right now Papua New Guinea doesn't have uh, a significant amount of investment into geothermal, does have a very large potential for that um, because of the, the region. And with that, we believe it's very similar to, to hydroelectric with in further inv uh, investment into geothermal um, in specific regions, especially for some of the, uh, the cities that are off the grid or, or not connected to some of the, the three main grids, uh, geothermal could be and would be a, a viable investment for, for those uh, communities. And so most of it wasn't um, specific uh, analysis comparisons, but we did look into the, the usability of geothermal and its feasibility within Papua New Guinea. Right, if I may add on to that, um, we were thinking when we did the approach of there is a potential there for geothermal, it lies on the ring of fire. So there is volcanoes there. So there is a lot of potential for it, but it's not been specifically kind of explored. So we're thinking if we put more exploration to it by 2040 with evolution of technologies happening, you know, every decade or so, we will be able to achieve that. So this is kind of a proposed um, plan that we, we hope to achieve by 2040. It may not essentially work out that way, but uh, if we try going on our path, at least we can get close to achieving that. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? None here. And if you have time, I guess I'll ask, just looking at this chart that you have. So I assume this is your chart or is this from a government uh, plan? Is it your chart? So this is our chart. The initial uh, divisions were from, I believe, the CIA World Factbook. Um, so it's, it's integrated a couple different uh, data points, but, but the entirety of the chart is something that we so optimistically this is, predict. this is your vision? Yes. Is that correct, your team's vision? Yes, sir. And I guess, you know, as an economist, what I'm struggling with is, you know, along the questions that Rob and Melody asked, like, where is the economic justification, the cost justification for this transition to take place? So, so I, I would have liked to see a little bit more on that, maybe as Melody suggested, a table, at least comparing the potential cost. And if there's a need for a subsidy for decentralized solution, you could identify the scope of that. You know, that kind of thing would have been great. Mm -hmm. And so one other aspect of that that we were, we were considering is a lot of the decisions will, we, we hope would be made by private companies. So we don't want to dictate a specific amount of energy that must be achieved. Uh, we only want to incentivize certain energy developments and, and for specific communities. Um, so although this is our, our op, uh, optimistic well, prediction, um, we, we are open and would like to see uh, private industry having their own goals towards these, these energy types. And Does that one, one thing to note as well is uh, we believe that in, in, in producing this plan, one thing that we ran with the entire way is this idea that 
Uh, when you're trying to develop a blanket plan for an entire country that's so diverse, it can be a very difficult thing. So we believe with all the intricacies of the, the amount of diversity of culture and society that you see in Papua New Guinea, um, that a lot of these decisions are best made moving forward with the plan and actually working with the government and the actual implementation of our vision. That's an excellent point, Logan. I totally see that for a place like PNG or DRC. All of the countries that in this competition, they have similar challenges from that perspective. Absolutely. Uh, so acknowledging that is very important. So I, I appreciate that. Time has finished for the question answer session. All right, thank you, Team 163. Um, judges, moment, and um, Team you're on deck, KEYJ. -E so please come off mute and share your screens. And uh, I'll signal you to start in a moment. All right. All right, you're awesome. Good luck. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kamal and my partners are Jacob, Emmett, and Yanni. We're students from UT Austin. In the DRC's nationally determined contribution to the Paris Agreement, they state that their goal is to become an emerging country between 2020 and 2030 through development of the energy sector. We wanna facilitate this by ushering in an era of modernization, increasing quality of life, and developing sustainable energy in the DRC. We created a three-pronged approach that was not bogged down in idealism, but instead rooted in reality. Currently, the DRC has an electrification rate of 9%. Our research continually showed it is virtually impossible to reach energy independence without first utilizing the benefits of oil and natural gas. We also found a direct correlation between the human development index and fossil fuel consumption. These benefits are why the use of oil and natural gas is crucial to achieving 100% sustainable energy. The drilling of oil is predicated on the investment of private companies. International oil companies have already set a precedent for doing this by investing a large sum into exploration, drilling, and extraction. We created a tailored production sharing contract between the DRC and a potential private investor, structuring it to be very appealing to the private company to give them a strong incentive to invest. Over time, the DRC will pay this off until the company is receiving a much smaller share. The relatively new president, Felix Shishiketi, has already begun developing a more stable relationship with the US and is eliminating potential risks of investing in the DRC. This creates a promising future for investment. To ensure completion, international pressure from organizations with sanctioning ability is crucial and investments from reputable international sources will act as a quasi insurance policy for a robust contract. Once enough profit is generated from oil, we will begin extracting natural gas from Lake Kivu, which currently has 60 billion cubic meters of methane gas. This project has already begun on the other side of the lake in Rwanda. The lake releases 250,000 cubic meters of methane annually, posing a danger to the surrounding population. Additionally, natural gas produces 30% less greenhouse gas emissions than oil and 60% less than coal. The project will strictly comply with African Development Bank standards to prevent lasting environmental damage. We will also invest into the rehabilitation of hydroelectric plants. The DRC has the capacity to use hydropower to provide energy to almost all of the populace, but neglect and lack of care for existing plants has severely inhibited that potential. Currently, the DRC gets 98% of its electricity from hydropower. With our strategy, the rehabilitation of the Inga 2 Dam will increase its capacity by over 100%. Along with hydropower, we want to utilize the geothermal vents along the eastern border to move away from fossil fuels and towards clean, sustainable energy. Kenya, which lies along a similar geothermal vent, has already set precedent for using this type of energy to great success. We then dive into our timeline. The extraction of oil will begin in 2027, allowing for the extraction of gas by 2030 and the rehabilitation of the Inga 2 Dam by 2031. Research and development for geothermal energy will begin in 2040, setting the DRC up for a future of success. Thank you. We're ready for questions. I never know what order we're in, so I'm gonna just jump in here if that's okay. 
on questions just for um, for sake of time. Anyway, good job, team. And I, I want to really delve into your um, the, the the main solution that you're proposing is predicated on um, uh, oil, onshore oil. And as you, we know, DRC is pretty landlocked, except for a little tiny sliver to the um, offshore, which is fully developed. And um, you, you focus on the PSC and the contracts, that's great, but really I, I wanna understand how did you assess the exploration prospectivity of oil resources onshore? There's very little onshore um, prospectivity in Africa. A lot of it's offshore because of geologic events, but what, what was your source to understand that you have the pro prospectivity onshore in DRC to predicate your um, solution? So currently, in barrels of proven reserves, but going to the embassy, there's a five billion um, estimated barrels of oil in the DRC that has been undisclosed. So because of that, can they hear me? We believe that um, because can they hear me? Because of the the fact that there is um, so many, so much oil in the area, we believe that um, a lot of private companies would be, um, they would want to come to the DRC, uh, especially because um, we, like we said, uh, President Shishketi has expressed interest in mending ties with the US. And we think that if um, international companies or uh, organizations like the US DFC would provide uh, insurance for American companies to come in and invest. Um, I think this would be a great investment for mid-sized um, oil firms such as HKN, Murphy Oil, Viking International, um, Afren. They all have um, ties in the Middle Eastern area. And I think that they could do the research. Um, they would wanna come in. There's a lot of um, areas that they could find that have such a potential to drill oil. And I think this would be, be extremely helpful. And, and maybe in your evaluation, why is it that they have not come in already? What has been the, the barrier that now has changed? Yeah, that, that's a great question. We, and we looked a lot into that. Uh, the main reason that they have not been, there's not been a good investment from private companies into the oil sector of the DRC economy um, is mostly just corruption. Um, the so power has just been transferred to a new president last year. Uh, the previous regime had a vested interest in maintaining power on the country. Um, the decentralization of the oil sector to private companies and the transfer of that responsibility to private companies would be a huge power hit to that regime. Um, they would lose the grasp on the energy autonomy of the country. Uh, and even though the expansion would increase the GDP of the country and the human development index, uh, the power regime was not ready to uh, sacrifice the kind of firm grasp they had on the energy sector of the economy and transfer that over to private companies. Thank you for sharing that insight. I, I didn't come through in the presentation that you had done the resource evaluation and the extent to which you had studied that. And it is a main part of your um, premise. So anyway, thank you for the explanation. Okay, I think it's my turn. Um, I had a lot of trouble connecting what's, 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 what's sort of essentially a, a, an economic development program of trying to develop the natural resources to raise revenues for the country to, to an actual energy program. I recognize that oil is a carrier of energy um, and a store of energy, but, but it's not in itself an energy project. You talked a little bit about generation, but, but a key feature of your plan relies on the government channeling explicitly those, the oil rents they're gonna get from developing those resources into future energy system development. The, the track record of African countries doing that is very poor. Um, thinking of the obvious example of Nigeria, but there are obviously several others. And there's a civil war beginning in Mozambique even now. How, how do you ensure that that channeling of resources into energy development to actually benefit the, the people occurs? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And we looked a lot into that because obviously uh, there's the, the, the vast possibility 
for the misallocation of these funds and the political strife that can be created from a booming energy sector. Um, so that's why we really focused on President Xi Shiketi's new form relationship with the United States and other uh, G20 powers in the United Nations. Uh, additionally, we looked into a lot of organizations that would be interested in kind of giving almost an assurance policy for these projects. This includes stuff like the United States uh, Development Fund and the African uh, National Development Fund. Uh, these projects, if they can see promise and potential in, in the, for example, the oil or natural gas sectors of that economy, uh, then they will actually invest in infrastructure projects and they will give very uh, loose agreement loans to the country so they can further develop you know, these sectors and avoid, as you're speaking of, this, these potential pitfalls. And, and the way they, they kind of force that is these loans can only be spent, obviously, on certain parts of infrastructure and investments. Uh, so as long as the allocation of the funds is channeled by these international organizations, uh, then we, you don't, we don't see a lot of room for the DRC uh, people in power, the president and the minister of energy to kind of misuse those funds into other projects. I see. So you're, you're talking about essentially collateralizing the resources. That's exactly correct. Okay, so I mean, since Melody and Rob asked all the questions that I had when I went through your presentations, I'll ask something very specific. By the way, uh, Jacob, you're the only one who didn't get the team memo about the hairstyles, right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry guys, I couldn't help by nothing but notice. Okay, so the quick question, Kivu gas. So that's interesting. You know, that lake sometimes sends methane bubbles, which kind of explode and stuff like that. But what will DRC do with the gas once they produce it? Uh, right. So we would pretty much be mimicking exactly what's going on across the lake, where they would send it over to power stations to be refined. And then from that, um, it would either end up being distributed out through a power system created by the private uh, company or it would be sold off for profit. So they're going to have to build a power plant? Right, yes. So is there such demand or transmission and distribution grid in nearby the lake that they can do that? Yeah, so the, the demand is, is there. Um, so creating these power plants um, the, obviously, the, so the DRC only has $320 million to invest in energy expansion annually. Um, so because the, this process is going to be a private process, the privatization of the extraction will actually lead the private companies to invest in these power stations. Uh, and then when you combine that with the resources that are going to be brought in from these international development organizations, uh, this money can be diverted into the distribution and uh, refinement of these of this energy. Um, so one thing we did look at, because when we looked into that process, uh, we did notice that if uh, the booming energy sector in the DRC actually kind of followed the trajectory that we wanted, uh, this would cause problems with other industries, such as the agriculture industry um, and the manufacturing industry, just because of the, the economic phenomenon, phenomenon of Dutch disease in which one uh, booming industry kind of hurts other industries due to inflation. Uh, so how we mitigated that also uh, was just through a process of kind of economic sterilization in which the these third party uh, independent organizations like the UN or the World Bank would actually limit the amount of uh, money that the DRC could collect at one time from royalties from these private companies. Uh, that way that would alleviate some of the inflation that would be caused and it wouldn't hurt the other industries too much. Okay, we have less than a minute, but okay. So you jumped onto some of the, again, economic development challenges and everything. I mean, development of Kiva gas is not going to cause Dutch disease. I'm still struggling to understand how is this going to work. So in the Rwanda case, did Contour Global produce the gas, but also build the power plant to burn that gas and distribute it to the nearby regions? Did they do all of it or was there involvement by the state company in Rwanda? Um, so there was little, there was some involvement by the state company, but uh, Contour Global did pretty much everything. They, they um, invented essentially this method of extraction. They built the power stations and then they've also kind of revitalized the community and started focusing on distribution um, in the communities directly surrounding the lake. 
Okay. Thank you. Time has finished. Thank you, Team 190. Um, judges, please take a moment. And Team 214, Energizer Bunny, uh, please uh, come off mute and share your screens. And we'll cue you when to begin momentarily. All right, all set. Good luck. All right, let's get started. Uh, hello, my name is Rishi Panikanti. My name is Karen Scully. I'm Ishan Shah. I'm Anjali Patel, and we are Team 214, Team Energizer Bunny, and our country is Papua New Guinea. The main problem with Papua New Guinea is that the rural areas do not have adequate access to energy in comparison to the areas on the coast. Thus, our solution is going to be made up of three different parts, the technology, how we're actually going to bring energy to the citizens of Papua New Guinea, as well as um, economic investment and education. So our technological solution is centered around the community and these community centers. And there's three approaches or three parts to this, the generation, the use and the storage. So our generation is a combination of solar panels and biomass generators. Uh, the use will centralize around these community centers and allow the citizens of these communities to utilize that power in these centralized locations. And the storage will uh, have rechargeable home batteries that are charged at these community centers and can be checked out by the citizens in order to power their individual homes if they need access to power immediately. So it would mainly incentivize us to pick solar energy over the alternatives like hydropower and fossil fuels is because it's a great combination of both cost efficiency and it doesn't leave a very harsh environmental impact, which is really important for an economy like Papua New Guinea's, which heavily relies on exports. And after doing some economic analysis, we can see that numerous studies have shown how energy is actually related to GDP per capita in a positive way. And that uh, an effect like this would actually lead to a lot of long-term stability. And most importantly, it would help these areas that are uh, rural, which have uh, less energy security than those urban areas, which is exactly what we're trying to target. And the goal of investing in them energy wise is to really create this long term lasting effect. And by doing that, as we go into communities to help build these energy centers, not only will we be working beside local leaders to build these energy centers, but as we're doing that, we're also going to work with them to create these educational resources that they can use to educate their community. And throughout the timeline, we're going to expand that to a national level. And so in order to ensure that this is a sustainable approach, we're making sure to at first meet the current needs of the nation without overspending or overwhelming them. Um, our technological solution also allows for modularity. So with those three components, each part can be interchanged as technological advancements happen. So that way it doesn't become outdated. Um, we have renewable energy generation sources to ensure that we're not having uh, bad effects to the environment and make sure that this is long lasting. And as Karen just mentioned, our education is going to ensure that the nation itself can have self-reliance and sustainability in the future. Lastly, our plan is also culturally sensitive in that we don't um, have any mass construction of grids and we are also utilizing existing networks to avoid any additional construction of the land. And then lastly, we plan to educate the people so that way they understand the systems we implement. So the team that time has finished, so we now proceed to the question and answer session. I think that's me this time. Uh, let's see. All right. I, I loved your emphasis on uh, the rural problem and, and in particular on, on 
uh, bringing societal benefits to these rural communities uh, using education and healthcare and so on. It's really strong. Uh, and also, of course, the use of distributed technologies. What I didn't really get from your, your talk just now, nor from your longer talk, was how the businesses are constructed uh, that, that uh, are, are selling these services and how you're ensuring that they have long-term viability. Could you say more about the business model? So one of the biggest aspects of our solution is we're actually going to be utilizing this program called the Rural Primary Health Services Delivery Project. This went on from 2011 to 2019. And essentially um, a collaboration of a bunch of institutions went into Papua New Guinea and built 50 different um, health clinics throughout the countryside and rural population of Papua New Guinea. And those health clinics are not only functioning now to um, minister health-wise to the citizens, but there are current um, processes set up between those health clinics so that people can deliver health supplies and they have transportation between them too. So um, our plan is to go into those health clinics, which have already been built up in these community centers and to build alongside them and to really um, create more of a community setting. And we're creating these energy centers along with the health services where people are already coming in from the rural um, rural communities to be administered to. So this is like a common place where people would have access to these things. Okay. Anyone want to add anything to that? I think that just about covers it. Okay. So you're relying on a healthcare system for energy distribution. Yes, it's a system that's already in place and it's been funded by the government and still ongoing and ministering to the citizens of Papua New Guinea. So we're expecting by working alongside that, um, it'll be an easy avenue in. And people will, and the citizens of Papua New Guinea will have already come to terms and accepted that and we won't be like intruding into them on like a cultural sensitivity aspect of that. Okay. Next. Okay, I think that's me. Uh, I had several questions for you and you did not emphasize my main question in your current summary. So let me ask a small question. Uh, I like this leveraging idea of leveraging of existing programs and uh, piggybacking on the existing facilities that is supported by the government as well as international donor agencies. But did you check to see whether the locations of those facilities around the country are appropriate for solar? Because a lot of PNG is in rainforests, so they're not necessarily going to be able to generate much electricity from solar. So that's uh, one very quick question. Uh, and then the related question is, you emphasize this in your main presentation, like, yes, there's a correlation between energy consumption and GDP growth, and you were making the case, but with these systems that are very creative, I like the idea, as long as the solar works with the batteries being handed out to households, how much electricity do you think that people are going to be able to consume with that, those systems, and what kind of economic activity are they going to be able to generate from that amount of electricity that's gonna really fuel uh, economic growth. Okay. I can uh, take the first part of that question about the, the solar. Um, so the rural areas of Papua New Guinea are more centralized and the central areas of the nation are actually sort of almost unusually high photovoltaic potential. Um, so they have a very good way to gather a lot of solar energy. Um, but like you said, there are a lot of shaded areas and, and forested areas, which is why we're sort of supplementing that with the biomass. Um, so in areas where maybe solar is not as effective in certain parts of the day, um, the point of the supplemental energy generation source is to make use of the excess agricultural waste. And in a lot of these rural areas, agriculture is a big part of their livelihood. And so there's a lot of agricultural waste that can be used to then generate energy. Um, and a great part also about having this combinational generation and storage system is that when the energy is not necessarily being used immediately from the solar cells, let's say it's a really sunny day, but people aren't as active, that can then be stored and used at a later time. So our, our goal with this is to make sure that we're kind of coming at this from a few angles. So we're not relying on one specific thing over another and making sure that we're kind of covering all of our bases and leaving room for improvement, especially. Um, and then as far as the economic side of things, I think I'll let Ishan tackle that one. Yeah, so the US Energy Administration has actually shown a lot of data about how developing countries have gone from um, 
you know, just developing to um, almost developed with this uh, increase in electricity usage. So we expect to see a lot of similar growth, especially because Papua New Guinea currently has a very low energy consumption. And overall through that, we, we just expect that um, some combination of like their household usage and then also with our community plan that we'll be able to sustain uh, growth in the economy, both in our communities and then just in Papua New Guinea overall, um, just through a, like a combination of our plan and then what we think that energy security will be able to provide. Okay. I mean, and I, I don't need an answer, but just a point here. Yes, there is a correlation between energy consumption, electric consumption, and economic growth. But when you give a battery to a household that they may run for two to three hours to run maybe a light bulb, a TV, a radio, and nothing else, do you really expect any major economic activity coming out of that? That was my question. And you don't have to answer that. There, there's a fundamental correlation that is correct. But that was my main question. It will improve the quality of life, but will it really lead to economic growth? Anyway, next question. Well, my, my question was really along that line. So let me, let me ask it. I, I was really um, want to understand better your selection to go from solar to battery versus solar to microgrid. And um, that, I mean, really thinking long-term sustainability for the citizens, you know, intermittency and unreliable power is almost as challenging or equally challenging as no access. And I would just think the intermittency of the batteries, the ability to have a power uh, controller in the, in the middle um, for the villages with the battery owners, even though leveraged by the health um, organization, so help me understand that choice and how do you feel, help us understand how you see that as a sustainable solution for these long houses and these villages, which I've spent time in um, to, as their long-term viable solution. So kind of the reason that we didn't wanna really go with microgrids was a little bit twofold, um, somewhat of the economic side of things, um, it being a little bit more expensive than our approach. And then also we wanted to kind of go as off grid and off micro grid as possible, um, especially towards the beginning, because we like uh, I think we mentioned earlier, we didn't want to sort of overwhelm and we wanted to meet the, the needs of, of this country. So the current needs that we've sort of seen are not as extensive or nearly extensive as a developed country like the United States, obviously. So something like microgrids that are used in rural areas in the US or more developed nations um, will be useful for that for those purposes. But this approach we see as more of sort of a, allowing them to use the power when necessary. And so they can use it at the community centers if needed. And that will be on its own uh, own sort of consolidated uh, grid itself. But the, um, the, cent the homes will not be attached on any sort of plane to a grid. So that way the, uh, the power there is not reliant on everything else and they can use it when needed and, and no more. And kind of to just address your last question as well as as well as this one is um, by using these batteries, they can um, as the current energy usage is really low, they can use it for things that really need that energy, such as powering cell phones and powering computers. And um, as I know, the rural communications project is currently in place as they're installing telecommunication points all across Papua New Guinea. And as that project is also going on simultaneously, we can work alongside them as well to increase phone usage and that would further increase internet access and just connectivity all across Papua New Guinea. And that has very long-term effects. Is there time for one more question? We're gonna, I'll just ask it. One minute. Yes, no. there's so you, you've, you've placed a lot of emphasis on this particular off-grid strategy, but, but did you exclude grid extension into rural areas as, as part of your plan or in what way did you, did you incorporate that in your thinking? So when we were talking about this at first and thinking about the grid approach, what we saw was that this had been sort of thought about and attempted in both Papua New Guinea itself and other areas like Papua New Guinea with its sort of uh, un- I guess not very kind terrain to something like extending a grid and the cost was just gonna be way too much for something as simple as getting a little bit of energy access out to the rural areas. So we wanted to sort of circumvent that entire strategy entirely and try to think about a different approach that wouldn't rely on 
the sort of standard grid, expand the power from where it is to where it needs to go, but instead maybe generate the power at a place where it needs to go. So that way the distribution is not as, uh, as long and does not take as much, uh, as much money to, to distribute that energy. Okay, thank you. The time has completed for the question answer session. Thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you. All right, thank you team 214. Um, judges, please take a moment to uh, record your scores. And last but not least, we have team 218 UNDB uh, from Algeria. Uh, so please uh, come off mute and share your screens. Thank you. And we'll cue you in to start momentarily. All right, you can start when you're ready. Good luck. Hello everyone, we are team UNDB. Dear judges, dear attendees, I would like to thank you for being here to, to attend our presentation about energy solution in Papua New Guinea. We started our analysis with an overview about the actual situation of the country, economy, energy demand, and supplies, uh, energy demand and supply statics, statistics. We work on assessing the energy resources potential and challenges, which are hydropower, geothermal, and gas and oil, as three fundamental resources in addition to solar, wind, energy, and bio biomass. These will allow us to reinforce our plan. Still, we cannot depend on them since they are too expensive for a large scale for the country compared to the other alternatives. Since PNG is a group of six, uh, 600 islands, we adopt the solution according to the location because the scale is important. Our plan aligns with the country vision mentioned in the development plan of 2050. So what we did was refining it to create a more reliable and efficient strategy based on diversifying energy supply with a focus on renewable one and reduce dependence on imported fuels for sustainable development. Starting with the short to a mid and a long term, the proposal relies on four pillars, private sector, foreigner investors, government, and especially people. In, in order to better argument the strategy, we suggest some real project where studies have been conducted or that are under construction currently. The desired plan was supported by strong arguments. With the aim of having a clear and stable roadmap, we put forward finance and negotiation opportunities related to transport, mining, oil and gas, and agricultural activities. During the process of implementing the proposal factor <coughs> are taken into consideration technical, economical, social and political ones with a deep comprehension of local communities features in order to conserve their culture. The vision we have is that by increasing the GDP and access to electricity, the standard mm -hmm. of living will be improved, including health, education, security, job opportunities, and so on. Keeping record of past failures, learning from them, and taking actions is the only way for Papua New Guinea to live in a better world. During the pandemic, we learned that how hard it is to live without electricity, even for a few seconds. So can you imagine what, what the daily life of a Papua New Guinean must look like? Finally, thank you, thank you, through thank you to us. That means thank you in PNG's language. Thank you. So okay. uh, we are ready for a question. Okay, thank you guys. Great job, uh, great summary. Of course, in your 10 minute video, you went to a lot of details. My question is, I mean, you did a great job identifying uh, very challenging socio-cultural conditions uh, in the country. 800 plus languages, uh, you know, very community-based living, you know, most people living outside, no concept of the future, no concept of next week and those kind of things. So can you elaborate a little bit more? How do you envision those kind of socio-cultural challenges impacting your plans? Well, uh, I think I can thank, uh, take this question. 
for uh, these uh, issues, we our uh, short-term plan uh, is based on uh, on attracting small businesses and uh, uh, let's say mining sector and oil and gas sector and the agricultural sector. So basically, uh, the beginning of our projects are not going to uh, to be affected by the cultural challenges since it is related to money and the small businesses will be, get attracted to, uh, to the money that the electricity can get them. Then once uh, they establish the short-term plan, the people are going to get uh, trained since we are relying on the, on the people and spread energy awareness. And they are going to be working uh, beside electrical uh, energy and so they will get uh, to know the notion of having electricity. Uh, Besides that, their income will increase. So uh, this can justify uh, that these challenges are going to be tackled uh, in the midterm and in the long term. Something else I can add that uh, PNG must like establish a new plan with the developed and ingenuous business sector. So uh, we, th we was thinking about creating a new uh, organization dealing with indigenous people with a facilitation team that can act as a mediator during the process of negotiation. So is the idea is to find people who have a, a variety of skills like a cultural mediation skills, knowledge of local issue and culture, interpretive skills, so that they uh, th the strategy will take like into consideration that Indigenous people are often excluded from any type of social participation, civil and political in, in PNG. So the role of the facilitation team is to make them visible, recognizing their existence and supporting them in the negotiation uh, for their rights. Okay, so, so, okay, just to clarify. So your plan will focus on developing geothermal, solar, gas, whatever it is to help mining industry, agricultural sector, or other major economic activities in the country so that that can fuel the economic development, then you will get to the rural electrification and things like that. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, yes, that's a fair summary. Besides that, we are uh, suggesting the small uh, hydropower, the mini hydropower and the PV electrical for the people who can afford it. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. I guess I'll go next. Um, I'm not sure the order here always, but um, anyway, I wanna just uh, commend your team for actually talking about the potential risks of your plan and how to mitigate those risks. I thought that was very insightful because um, you know it's good to, good to have a risk mitigation plan. Um, my, my question really was around, um, um, I, I didn't see the, the economic trade-offs. So you're, you're putting a lot of energy option solutions and you're scaling those from you know short term with this you know small invest small projects medium term just expanding those and then long term expanding even further so it's kind of all all of the energy options but expanded over time but how did you assess the economics of the the strongest um, um, solutions and try to put the focus towards the most economic, affordable energy solutions first versus later? And how did the economics drive your decision um, process? So uh, basically uh, in this context, what we did was, uh, if you said, uh, could you go to the slide of the three ports? A slide of the what? Three ports, the, the Port Moresby and uh, Lake City port. It's uh, uh, after the long term. So yeah, so what we did was to identify the potential markets for uh, energy, since uh, the need for energy is the biggest portion of the investment of a project. Uh, slide 46, uh, you said, 45, yes. Yeah, since the, the energy is the most, uh, the big part of the investment, we identified the places where uh, energy is needed. Here you can see Port Moresby, Lay City, and Kemp, which are the largest uh, ports in the country. So basically, we try to identify all the resources that are near these zones. Then we try to, uh, to select the most convenient one in order to implement at that place. 
So here you can see the transportation opportunity. So we look for the opportunities of energy that exists there. Then we suggest the implementation plan. Then uh, if you can go to the next slide. Yes, here are two big uh, uh, mines. So basically we looked uh, at the potential energy that exists there. We found that there are some oil and gas, uh, some gas so a plants can be implemented and the Karimo project that can afford 1800 megawatts near these uh, zones. So the companies that invest in this place can invest in this solution that can uh, afford electricity for them and for the places that are around this area. Besides that, if you can go to the next slide, these are blocks that are under negotiation for, uh, in the country. So the country can use them as negotiation card. In order, uh, so when they are contracting with a uh, foreigner company, they can uh, uh, agree that they built uh, the power plants that the country need. For adding to that, if we go to the agriculture, we identify the places uh, where the, 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 the country make uh, income on, so the palm oil, and we try to identify the, 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 the potential energy in order to select uh, the convenient resources there. So it's all based on uh, the economy first, then uh, we select the, the, the suitable solution, then we try to find uh, arguments to implement it. So uh, one point I would like to mention is that it, it is not convenient to make uh, a project for rural areas or uh, at, uh, in o just in order to make a social impact. Uh, the energy project need to make money before, uh, before implementing it. So we need to, to have an assessment on uh, the success of the project. Yeah, yeah, yeah nice job explaining the basic concept. So um, on the video, thank you. Sorry, Melody, I didn't mean to cut you off. I thought you'd, you'd finished. No. I, I know I'm third this time. I, um, if you had something more you wanted to ask, I don't no. me. Um, I, I, you're, you're talking about a really interesting challenge in all of these um, energy development programs in developing countries of trying to get necessary generation online so that industry can function and, and generate profits. But you're, you're really paying... Um, almost sole attention to it, as far as I can understand in your plan in, in the early years and, and ignoring the rural problem uh, to a large degree. Can, can you sort me out on that? I mean, to what degree does your plan include rural electrification in, in the early years? So uh, in the early years, uh, there is a problem uh, in PNG that we need to take into consideration. If we focus on the rural areas on uh, the early years, they are not going to succeed. Why is that? Because it's, uh, there is an experience that have uh, a project that was implemented uh, in uh, PNG uh, that target the rural areas where they sell solar panels to the people. So the people, what they do, they, uh, they either uh, steal them or they uh, uh, destruct them. So they are not functioning anymore. So uh, if we focus on the rural area, the project is not going to succeed. Uh, and according to that project, they invested uh, 10,000 units, only one le left after the study. So what we do is that we uh, introduce the uh, energy into schools and medical centers and the, the, the industries that people get familiar with it. And after the short term, uh, when we reach the mid term, there will be an awareness and the people have developed the concept of using uh, the public services or the energy. Thus, by that time, uh, from the midterm to the long term, we can focus on the rural area. Okay, thank you. Okay. The time has finished. All right, judges, please take a moment to record the last score. And teams, congratulations. We've now finished all the presentations. Um, while the judges are scoring and then we'll calculate the scores, um, I'm going to toss it over to Taha uh, to give a reflection on the, uh, the journey we've gone on in this case competition. So Taha, take it away. Thank you, Philip. And 
Hello everyone, I am Sayyid Talha Tirmizi and I am a Petroleum Engineering graduate from NED University of Engineering and Technology, Karachi, Pakistan, and I am one of the organizers for this case competition. So International Switch Energy Case Competition brought an overwhelming number of 900 plus participants signed up in 250 plus teams from 37 countries from every inhabited continent. So this brought us to an opportunity of having an incredibly diversified and a global competition filled with lots of stories and memories. So when we launched the registrations for the International Switch Energy Case Competition, we were really overwhelmed by the huge response that we received from the people. We were really pleased to hear the queries from the team. Some people also asked us about the fees. Definitely, there wasn't any fees for the participation because we wanted the competition to be open for everyone. Several students didn't know where to start or they thought that they might not be ready to compete in the case competition. And there were several more of the interesting queries that we received from the team. And we had a very good pleasure to help them. So we also learned that the concept of energy access for all appeals to every age group. As we had seen interest even from the high school students, but this competition was for university students. So taking the step to help solve energy poverty is a struggle within itself. This competition brought in a lot of struggle stories in the limelight. So the COVID-19 pandemic has affected billions of people all over the world. But it was really impressive to see that this pandemic didn't even stand a chance in front of the dedication and devotion of the highly commendable people all over the world who struggled to participate in this case competition during this stressful pandemic situation. So the devotion of the teams from all over the world is very evident by knowing that how they managed to be part of this exciting journey of international switch energy case competition and irrespective of facing devastating events in their regions, including the event of Hurricane Sally that brought catastrophic flooding in many areas of Southern USA. We also heard a news of the struggle of the team from Azerbaijan due to national turmoil there. And we were really sad to hear the situation from Nigeria, where one of the team had to actually pull back from the case competition. However, they were halfway in brainstorming on energy solutions and were having a very brilliant support from their mentors. But sadly, the psychological and emotional trauma was so intense for them that they were not able to focus on this case competition. It's really sad to hear such stories where teams are unable to participate because of the things that are outside of their control. Even to see them participate in this competition is no doubt an excellent example of dedication and devotion for a noble cause of solving history is one of the greatest challenges that is energy poverty. So on this occasion, I would like to say a motivational quote by Sarah Ben Brethnik. Always remember that striving and struggle received success, even in the dictionary. So we all hope that this competition has been a very enjoyable and transformative experience for both the participants and volunteers. Thank you so much, everyone. And now I wish to pass on to Philip and Tristan.
Everyone, we're still calculating the scores. Uh, just give us one moment so we can double check everything and then we'll continue. Thanks. The results are in. The judges have finalized their submissions and the results have been calculated. So coming in at seventh place, we have team 190, KEYJ, congratulations. In sixth place, we have team 146, Lalton. In fifth place, we have team number 163, Texan Sparking the World. In fourth place, we have 214, Energizer Bunny. And in third place, we have Team 76, Hyperion. Great job, guys. All right, so for the final places, in second place, we have 218, UNDB. And in first place, our winner, Team 99 in the greens. Congratulations, teams. Thank you so much. What an honor. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. So this has been a really exciting event, everyone. Once again, congrats to all the finalists. Y'all have worked really hard to make it here, and it's really nice to see all that work paying off. Hopefully, you see now quite literally. In addition to the prize money, think about all the knowledge that you've gained about your chosen country's energy situation, your newfound perspective on global energy poverty, and all the experiences that you've had throughout the competition. Even some of the mentors that we've heard from have had their eyes opened from working with the teams and learning about the regular uh, power outages and obstacles that you all face in your respective countries. This is Switch Energy Alliance's mission to educate people on the impacts of energy poverty and then to encourage the development of solutions. As an organizer, I had a great time getting to meet and interact with many of y'all and watching your presentations today. Thank you to all the participants yeah. for your passion to help make this world a more energy secure place. And thank you to 240 mentors, 36 primary judges, eight semifinal judges, and the three finalist judges here today. This competition would not have been possible without your support and insight. Thank you, everyone. We hope this has been an enjoyable and transformative experience for both the participants and volunteers. And we'd like to get everyone's feedback about the competition. So we'll be sending out a short survey. Um, we ask that you all complete it and let us know if you have any suggestions that we can implement in the following years. Uh, while this does mark the end of the competition, use what you've learned to make your friends aware of the progress that must be made to rid the world of energy poverty. Once again, congratulations to all the finalists and thank you for Everyone, for your active engagement throughout the 2020 Switch Energy um, International Case Competition. Bye, everyone. Excellent job.